Before we begin this week's episode, I want to warn you that we will be discussing graphic things that some of you might find distasteful. Peter Curtin was an unimaginably cruel man, and we in no way want to glorify or minimize his hateful behavior. Listener discretion is strongly advised. An execution should be the most terrifying outcome of anyone's life. To one German serial killer, it was all he wanted. When Peter Curtin was arrested and convicted of nine murders in April 1931, he was swiftly sentenced to death via guillotine. Before he died, he asked this of a prison psychiatrist, quote, Tell me, after my head has been chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures." Unquote. He was known by many names during his 16-year rape and murder spree, but none brought a clearer, more evocative picture of his crimes than the vampire of Dusseldorf. Officially convicted of nine murders and seven attempted murders in 1931, Curtin may have been responsible for over 30 rapes and attempted murders. He confessed to 79. His victims ranged from age 45 to as young as five years old. His crimes were steeped in folklore and unimaginable violence. The myth of the vampire had spread across Europe centuries before the murders, but was brought uncomfortably into the spotlight when it was revealed Peter Curtin attempted to drink the blood from several of his victims' necks. As Curtin put it, quote, in the case of Oliger, I also sucked blood from the wound on her temple and from sheer from the stab in the neck. From the girl Schult, I only licked the blood from her hands." Unquote. Curtin spread fear and disgust throughout his corner of Germany as his rampage went from stabbings to stranglings to attacks with a hammer. The vampire of Dusseldorf killed with no discrimination and no mercy and enjoyed every minute of it. Hi, I'm Greg Poulsen, and welcome to Serial Killers, a new podcast diving into the minds and motives of some of the most infamous and notorious murderers. This is part one of our Peter Curtin introspective, the sadist killer who would be known as both the Dusseldorf monster and the vampire of Dusseldorf. If you want to listen to any episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them all on your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe. You can also listen on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode comes out every Monday. Visit our Facebook page, Parcast, to join the conversation. Curtin came from an exceptionally abusive home where he learned early on to equate violence with sex. One of 13 children, he was regularly beaten and forced to watch as his mother was abused by his father. And sometimes, they were forced to witness something even more disturbing. Both alcoholics, Curtin's mother and father, would regularly binge drink and herd their children into a room where they were forced to watch their parents having sex. The beatings and constant sexual abuse shaped a twisted worldview that would affect Curtin almost immediately. Though never confirmed, Curtin claimed he committed his first murder at only nine years old. Curtin said he pushed a classmate into a lake, knowing the little boy couldn't swim. When another schoolboy jumped in to save his drowning friend, Curtin held his head underwater. The double drowning was ruled an accident. Curtin's childhood trauma created the perfect cocktail for a killer, an inability and unwillingness to control his impulses, latent anger at society, and sexual gratification when faced with violence. He enjoyed inflicting pain on his victims, a condition we now refer to as sadism. We'll explore the hallmarks of sadism and what it means to be a sadistic killer. Let's bring in Vanessa. Vanessa will be answering questions I have about the mental makeup of a serial killer, what makes them tick, what molded them, and what their thought process is like, as well as providing other valuable insight. 
It's important to note that she's not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but like me, she's fascinated by the psychology of serial killers and has done a lot of research for the show. Vanessa, what would cause a person to literally crave violence and pain? Nothing good, I can promise you that. Would you mind explaining to our listeners the clinical definition of a sadist? Of course. A sadist is defined as an individual who receives sexual gratification or emotional fulfillment from seeing another person hurt or humiliated in some way, as defined in the DSM-3. This is not to be confused with masochism, in which the person being harmed or humiliated receives pleasure from it. For a sadist to get what they want, does the other person need to be unwilling? Sadism as a fetish does not need to be non-consensual. For example, one subset of the fetish, BDSM, has strict rules and guidelines that its participants must follow. You run into problems when a sadist also has a total lack of empathy. Do the two personality conditions go hand in hand? Not overwhelmingly often. To be frank, almost all of us exhibit low-level sadistic tendencies in our daily lives. <laughs> if that sounds unbelievable to you, think back to the last time you played a video game against your friend and killed them or laughed hysterically when someone is hit in the crotch by a football on TV. That little fissure of smug satisfaction, that's sadism on a micro scale. Peter Curtin had it in spades. When Curtin was 11, his father was arrested for raping Peter's sister repeatedly. Two years later, Curtin attempted to rape the same sister before she fought him off. After robbing his boss and mother, Curtin ran away from home in 1899 at age 16. He would move 90 miles south to Koblenz, Germany, but according to his police account, he couldn't resist one last parting shot on his way out of Dusseldorf. <laughs> Curtin met an 18-year-old girl on a busy street who he did not name for the police. He convinced her to go with him to the Horgarten, a large park in Dusseldorf. The police were never able to confirm his story, but Curtin's account of what happened once they reached the Horgarten fits perfectly within his later years of rape and murder. He allegedly raped her and then strangled her to death with his bare hands. The amount of force necessary to strangle a full-grown struggling woman to death is not negligible. Curtin moved down to Koblenz not too long after the murder, and he soon found another outlet for his building aggression. He began a relationship with a local prostitute, and he found in her a partner willing to do anything demanded of her. Peter Curtin dabbled in pain, humiliation, and strangulation, beginning in his preteen years. Curtin conceivably demanded much of his new girlfriend. His sexual life was no less flag-raising than his penchant for criminal mischief. It's important to note that sadism and sexual sadism disorder, as defined by the American Psychiatric Association's manual, the DSM-5, are related but not identical conditions. What makes them differ? Well, sexual sadism disorder is characterized by sexually harming an unwilling participant. It is the, quote, recurrent and intense sexual arousal from the physical or psychological suffering of another person as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors. So not all sadism is sexual. No, but whether it's sexual gratification or emotional release, a sadist's goal is to hurt the person they're interacting with, however they can. And Curtin very much wanted to harm the world at large. Curtin committed his first verifiable kill in 1913 he was 30 years old when he decided to turn back to his thieving roots and rob a tavern in Cologne, Germany. He found nine-year-old Christine Klein asleep in her bed upstairs. He strangled the little girl before repeatedly cutting her with his pocket knife. He slit her throat, finally ending the assault. Next are his own words when he confessed to the murder in 1931. But before, a content note I will repeat throughout our investigation into Curtin. He was an extremely sick man, and much of what he says will be graphic. Quote, It was on May 25th, 1913. I had been stealing, 
specializing in public bars or inns where the owners lived on the floor above. In a room above an inn at Klonmolheim, I discovered a child of about 10 asleep. Her head was facing the window. I seized it with my left hand and strangled her for about a minute and a half. The child woke up and struggled, but lost consciousness." End quote. By virtue of it being 1913, there's no audio recording of his confession, but the written account was revealing. He went into loving detail over the blood. I quote, I had a small but sharp pocket knife with me, and I held the child's head and cut her throat. I heard the blood spurt and drip on the mat beside the bed. It spurted an arch right over my hand. The whole thing lasted about three minutes. Then I locked the door again and went back home to Dusseldorf." End quote. You don't earn the nickname Vampire of Dusseldorf without a heavy fascination with blood. After he cut Christine's throat, he stayed and watched the blood drip down to the floor. By his own account, he enjoyed it so much he had an orgasm looking at the gore. This would become a common theme throughout his murders, and to our modern sensibilities, it seems unthinkable. But for a sexual sadist, this is textbook. Not to say anything about it being extreme. Christine was in visible pain and feeling obvious fear. It's a potent cocktail for someone who feeds on both. Curtin was leaving biological evidence at the crime scenes and even on or in the bodies of his victims. But DNA evidence was not a possibility in the 1920s. To the police force in Dusseldorf, it would have been closer to science fiction than actual science. Curtin went back to the scene of the crime the next morning, after Christine was discovered. He grabbed a drink at the pub directly across the tavern he had robbed and listened to the locals recount the grisly discovery. Vanessa, what would cause a killer to come back and listen anonymously? Well, according to criminal justice and behavior, violent sadists who have been arrested show generally higher rates of psychopathy, among other undesirable traits. So Peter Curtin would have enjoyed hearing people's reactions? Absolutely. Mm. Psychopaths have no moral center, for lack of a better term. They know their actions were wrong and don't feel any guilt or shame in committing them anyway. Curtin fed on pain and chaos and craved attention in his own quiet way. An angry pub would have been his hunting grounds. Curtin was so enthralled with the slaughter that he couldn't wait to replicate it. Two months after he strangled a knife to Christine to death, he burgled another tavern, where he happened upon 17-year-old Gertrude Franken asleep in her bed between her two sisters. Note that her bed was directly in the middle between her sisters. He strangled the girl to death and slipped out of the tavern undetected. Neither of Gertrude's sisters were disturbed in their sleep by her murder. Curtin took a short break from murder after Gertrude Franken to indulge in his other predilections. Well, this is getting a little dark. How about we take a short break to talk about our sponsor? I think that's a wise idea. Also a wise idea, Blue Apron. Incredible home cooking has never been more attainable. Mm, No more overspending at restaurants or high-end grocery stores. With Blue Apron, you can prepare delicious, memorable meals yourself in under 40 minutes. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, that's great, Greg and Vanessa, but I don't cook. Well, listen to this. I don't cook either. But Blue Apron gave me the feeling of, I could do this. And I did. The meals I cooked were so tasty. They really sound delicious. Some of the meals available in March include salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli, Mm. pork chops and miso butter with bok choy and marinated apple, vegetable chili and baked sweet potatoes with crispy tortilla strips, and spicy shrimp coconut curry with cabbage and rice. Mm, My mouth is watering just hearing those. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash killers. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash killers. Blue Apron, a better way to cook.
Curtin was fascinated with fire and continued to dabble in thievery and other petty crimes. But it was the arson that would get him caught for one of his longer stints in prison. Curtin was arrested in 1913 for arson on various buildings and homes and was sent away for eight years' time in jail. Vanessa, I've often heard pyromania listed as a common trigger among killers. Am I off base? Not entirely. The McDonald Triad, or its catchier name, the Homicidal Triad, is a set of three behavioral conditions that are believed to be more prevalent in violent offenders, animal cruelty, bedwetting, and obsessive fire setting. Do all three need to be present for the profile to fit? Good question. No, but at least two of the three are usually accounted for. What role does fire play in the triad? I would again like to stress that correlation does not always equal causation. With that out of the way, arrested offenders who exhibit the McDonald triad often had hellish childhoods. So an abused child would hypothetically be more susceptible to these violent traits. Well, what does fire do? It destroys. It doesn't answer to anyone. That certainly sounds like something a kid who feels powerless would respond to. How would someone distinguish between the McDonald triad and pyromania? Are they the same thing? Pyromania is defined as the uncontrollable urge to light fires, often for monetary gain. If you take out a large insurance policy on your drugstore and then burn it down, suddenly all that money is yours. Do this a few times and suddenly you have a very large sum of money for not much effort. It becomes a compulsion and a way to let the demons out. Pyromaniacs feel a rush when they light a fire. The homicidal triad is about releasing aggression or involuntary losses of control. Curtin felt a sexual thrill when he killed someone, most especially when blood was involved. Could arson have the same sexual effect? Curtin was never officially diagnosed with pyrophilia, a relatively uncommon fetish for fire. His history of arson and petty theft suggest he was out for money or the thrill of destruction, not sex. When Curtin was released from prison eight years later, in 1921, he returned to a life of petty crime, but kept his violence to a minimum. He even settled down, marrying an older woman named Augusta. They lived in wedded bliss until 1925, when Curtin moved his bride back to Dusseldorf. Peter may have vowed fidelity to his bride, but it didn't stop a rash of rapes once the Curtins came to town. Though he kept up a steady diet of assault and petty crime, Curtin would break his murder fast on February 3rd, 1929. Curtin attacked a local woman, Apollonia Kuhn, with a pair of sharpened scissors. He stabbed her 24 times. It was a random attack, senseless at its brutality. Despite the sheer volume of trauma, Curtin did not cut Apollonia's throat the way he had little Christine Klein. Apollonia survived the ordeal, but by the skin of her teeth. Medical reports recounted that some of the cuts were so deep, they nicked the bone. The first two weeks of February 1929 would prove to be the warm-up to Curtin's most sadistic kill streak. Just five days after Apollonia's stabbing, Curtin again used a pair of scissors to mutilate someone. But at least this time, the victim was dead before he got to the stabbing. He strangled nine-year-old Rosa Oliger before repeatedly stabbing his shears into her head, heart, belly, and genitals. Curtin's pyromania would rear its head again. He returned to the scene of the crime hours later, but still before Rosa had been discovered, and set her body on fire. Five days later, on February 13th, he would again put his scissors to work stabbing 45-year-old Rudolf Scheer 20 times. We know that while Curtin had methods of killing he preferred over others, such as strangling and throat slitting, what was the significance of the scissors? It suggests premeditation. Murders can be split into two basic categories, crimes of passion and crimes of careful planning. Curtin seemed to kill indiscriminately. He did not case his victims or learn their routines. He happened upon them, and if the mood struck, he would attack them. He knew how sharp the scissors were and knew how much damage they could do to a person. He carried them for the express purpose of using them again. 
Yes, Curtin didn't target anyone, but he knew he would be looking to add to his body count. He impulsively selected his victims, but meticulously planned the crimes. Why continue stabbing his victims after they'd already died? Sadists use pain to achieve their goals, and then go beyond it. They'll punch a kid for lunch money, and then just keep hitting them even after pocketing the cash. It's possible Curtin liked the fear, liked the power, and fed his addiction despite the fatalities. There was no conclusive reason why Curtin returned to burn Rosa Oliger's body. In 1929, there was no manhunt looking for the killer, and no reason to fear he would be caught. It could have been a holdover from his sadistic tendencies to torture body so that it would be unrecognizable for her parents. Or it could have been foreshadowing for Curtin's eventual paranoia. Curtin took a six-month break from his murder spree before breaking his fast on August 11th of 1929. He took a young woman named Maria Hahn out for a date in a pub, his scissors in tow. Curtin started with his requisite raping and strangling, and then patiently stabbed Maria repeatedly in the head and stomach. He straddled her body as she pleaded for him to let her go. Curtin toyed with Maria for over an hour before the young woman finally succumbed to her injuries and died. Whereas Curtin had never been afraid of his victims being discovered before, he became paranoid his wife would connect the blood on his clothes with the murders, as opposed to an animal or accident. He buried Maria's body in a cornfield and wrote an anonymous letter to the police sometime later to let them know where to find her remains. But just because Maria was properly buried doesn't mean Curtin was done with her. Curtin would visit her grave several times before his imprisonment and execution. As he told the police, quote, I went to the grave many times afterwards and kept improving on it. And every time I thought of what was lying there, and I was filled with satisfaction, unquote. The police were not able to ascertain what he meant by improving it, but we can assume he meant landscaping at least. What could a man like Curtin have gotten out of visiting Maria's gravesite? Much like keeping a trophy from their victims, visiting a crime scene or grave allows a killer to relive their crime and re-experience the emotions they felt when they killed. Ted Bundy kept heads to display around his apartment. Charles Albright scooped out his victim's eyes to keep in jars. Jeffrey Dahmer kept all manner of body parts from his victims. When you're proud of your work, you want to keep a memento with you to remind yourself. It's striking that Curtin would tell police he made improvements on the grave. I understand visiting to gloat, but why fix up Maria's gravesite? Well, it can be looked at two ways. It's a way to thumb its nose at the authorities who were unable to bring in a suspect before he confessed. Haha, ha, I can come here whenever I want and you won't know it's me. Exactly. Mm. But it can also be looked at as him preparing to perfect his technique. It gave him joy and satisfaction to know Maria was buried because of him. If he planned on filling up more graves, it would make sense for him to regularly tend to Maria's in anticipation for his new plots. Well, why wouldn't Curtin keep a physical souvenir? Once he was married, he became paranoid at the thought of his wife finding out about his predilections for murder. It's much easier to visit a gravesite than it is to hide a severed head in a family home. Curtin may have wanted to shield Augusta from the worst of his spree, but we should never mistake it for guilt or shame. In his own words, quote, I have no remorse. As to whether recollection of my deeds makes me feel ashamed, I will tell you, thinking back to all the details is not at all unpleasant. I rather enjoy it." Unquote. Curtin may have written to the police about Maria's whereabouts, but he wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Hoping to throw the police off his scent, Curtin switched out his scissors for a knife. He believed the police would somehow be so thrown by his change in murder weapon that they would conclude that there was more than one killer involved. He decided to try out his new tool on a very busy August 21st, 1929. He went walking out in Dusseldorf. He would stab three people in three separate attacks before the day was through. An 18-year-old girl, 
a 37-year-old woman, and a 30-year-old man all died under his knife. But Curtin did not stick around to bask in any of it. His rapid-fire attacks suggest an urgency that was missing in his prior killings. He took his time with Maria Hahn. He was with her for over an hour. He made sure to rob the taverns before killing Christine Klein and Gertrude Franken. These latest murders were rushed, without any time to save her. It looked like a compulsion, like he was scratching an itch quickly to make up for lost time. It's unusual for a sadist to inflict pain and then not observe their handiwork. Something was driving Peter Curtin to break whatever loose pattern he held. But he put his knife to use again just three days later. And here is where I put another disclaimer. What happened to these next children is horrific. Listener discretion is advised. August 24th, 1929. At a busy fair in Flea, Germany, a suburb of Dusseldorf, Curtin happened upon two young foster sisters. He quickly charmed the girls, 14-year-old Louisa Lenson and 5-year-old Gertrude Hamaker. Curtin sent Louisa to fetch him a pack of cigarettes, keeping Gertrude with him. Once Louisa was out of sight, Curtin led Gertrude to a nearby thicket of shrubs. Hidden from view, he hoisted the little girl into the air by her throat. He strangled the little girl until she fell unconscious, and then he cruelly slit her throat. They were not noticed during the murder, and Louisa soon joined them again. Louisa was not fast enough to scramble away, and Curtin strangled her as well. Unlike Gertrude, the teenager was not unconscious when Curtin stabbed his knife into her stomach. The poor girl bled out. Two children on their own are easy pickings for a sadist with absolutely no boundaries. They're the easiest to physically manipulate, and that's the ultimate taboo. Hurting a child and hurting an animal are particularly egregious to most of us, and Curtin's predilection for the most extreme sadism caught notice. Curtin confessed to his crimes in 1931 at the urging of his wife, whom he confessed to in a rare fit of morality. Psychiatrist Dr. Carl Berg wrote a book titled The Sadist in response to his admissions. Curtin's crimes were so heinous that a professional in the mental health field wrote an entire book detailing how sick he really was. And next week, we'll delve deeper into another childhood fascination of his, animal torture. We'll examine the more extreme aspects of the McDonald triad and see what effect child grooming could have had on the young, developing Peter Curtin. Thank you for listening to Serial Killers. Be sure to join us next Monday as we conclude our look into the twisted mind of Peter Curtin. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to Serial Killers on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or any other podcast directory. Or through our website, parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode of Serial Killers comes out every Monday. Please let us know what you think, and join the conversation on our Parcast Facebook page. You can tweet us at Parcast Network. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T Network. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler and developed by Ron Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro with production assistance by Joel Stein and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by Samantha Gubrash and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. If you're trying to decide what to listen to next, let me recommend Parcast's other podcast, Unsolved Murders, True Crime Stories. If you like serial killers or like true crime podcasts, movies, and TV shows, I believe you'll enjoy this podcast. With the help of an ensemble cast of voice actors, follow hosts Carter and Wendy as they take you on an entertaining journey through real crime scenes and attempt to solve the case. 
Listen now on your favorite podcast directory or by visiting parcast.com slash unsolved. That's spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unsolved. <laughs>